you know, uh, you know, I was in disbelief to a certain extent about what I learned that had transpired over the last 18 years in the Sun's organization. Um, I was saddened by it, disheartened. Um, I, I want to again apologize to the former, in some cases current, employees of the Phoenix Suns for what they had to experience. There's absolutely no excuse for it. Um, and we addressed it. Um, and, you know, I, I understand, I of course, have been following what's been said um, since we issued, you know, that, that, those findings. You know, let me reiterate, um, the conduct is indefensible, um, but I feel we dealt with it in a fair manner. In, in both taking into account um, the totality of the circumstances, not just those particular allegations, but the 18 years in which Mr. Sarver has owned the Suns and the Mercury. Um, but you know, part of the goal in being transparent here, and that is in issuing a public report, of course, is so that whether it's the media or the public can draw their own conclusions um, in the same way I did. I will say, though, that what, what I have access to is a bit different than the public because while we issued this report um, in the process of doing the investigation, our, the outside counsel um, who, conducted this, who conducted this review um, committed to confidentiality um, to anyone who wanted it was the vast majority of those who were interviewed. Um, plus, they looked at um, cell phones, you know, something like 80,000 documents. And so I have access to information that the public doesn't. And, and again, that I'm able to look at the totality of the circumstances around those events in a way that doesn't, in a way that we're not able to completely bring to life the nuance that you see, you know, around, that, that when you read a report or deal with it as, as sort of in short bursts of news reporting. Um, and I think that, that's, that puts me in a different position, ultimately, as the person who has to render the ultimate judgment um, about what is a fair outcome here. So I, you know, I, again, um, I wish I could share that with all, all of you, but I can't because that was the condition on which um, this investigation was conducted. But with that, um, happy to answer any questions regarding um, the Sarver situation or anything else. All right, we'll start with the third row on the right here, Tim. Right there. Hey, Tim. Hi, Adam, Tim Reynolds, AP. In 2014, you said that because Mr. Sterling's remarks became public, that that changed things. That was essentially the game changer in that situation, or in, in some respect. It, it was a slippery slope, I think, was the term you used at the time. These remarks, while the quotes have not been made public, the gist of it is now out. How is this situation different, and did you consider a similar sanction this time as you did with, with, with Mr. Sterling? In, in the case of Donald Sterling, I don't remember my precise words back then, but I think the commentary around it becoming public didn't go to ultimately um, what the consequences should be. I think it was, it was more the nature of how we learned about it, how the public was aware of it um, in, in a time where um, the, what, the way it was disseminated so quickly over the internet. Um, and I think there was, there was a, a a realism to it, you know, that exists when you have audio of something that um, put, you know, back to my earlier comments, put everyone in essence in the same position I was in. We were all looking at the same record. Um, any, anyone who cared to listen to Donald Sterling's words. Um, this case is very different and it's, and that was what I was, I was commenting on earlier. It's not that one was captured on and the other isn't because as we went through this investigation, and what was pointed out um, in the investigator's report is Mr. Sarver ultimately has acknowledged his behavior. Um, so there may be some d disagreement around the edges, but it's not really about a factual dispute here. 
It's not Mr. Sarver saying I never said that. What is lost, though, and in, in, in the differentiating between the facts in this situation and Donald Sterling is the context. And I have available to me more of a context than the public can, and that's just the nature of it, because we have investigators who then can explain and if what they learned in 320 interviews and say, for example, well, the person was there and heard those words, but this is how they interpreted them in that context. In the case of Sterling, we could all make our own judgments. But maybe then to go to your, really your ultimate question is why the penalty in the case of Donald Sterling is different than, than Mr. Sarver. So I'd say number one, it was the same law firm, the same investigators, both who looked into the Sterling matters, looked into Sarver's matter, and ultimately the same league office and the same ultimate judge. And for me, the situations were dramatically different. I think what, what we saw in the case of Donald Sterling was um, a blatant, um, blatant racist conduct um, directed um, at a select group of people. Um, and while it's difficult to know what is in someone's heart or in their mind, we heard those words, and then there was a follow-up from the league office, and that became public as well in terms of what Mr. Sterling even subsequently said about his action. 